This is Adunya. Adunya lives with her children in a farming community in rural Ethiopia, about 80 kilometers north of Bahir Dar. But Adunya's life is about to change. She will be one of the first residents of a new town that is slowly growing here. If you talk with Adunya, she will tell you that she sees many things in the promise of a new town, but mostly she sees opportunities for her children to have a better education, to open a shop and make a better income, to live in a modern home with a private well and private sanitation facilities, to have a better connection to other areas through new paved roads and electricity. In short, she sees the benefits of good urban planning can increase her quality of life. However, the current new town planning paradigm in Africa doesn't always live up to this potential. Africa is currently the fastest urbanizing continent in the world. And while most of that urbanization will not be planned, new towns have the potential to play an important role in Africa's urban future. In this film, we're going to look at many new towns across the African continent that have been designed and built since 1990. Some of these new towns show exciting new ideas about the future of cities in Africa. But many of them are based on old ideas that we know don't work. To get a clearer picture of these towns and cities, we will try to understand new towns as a specific urban form and identify the spatial challenges that are often present in these developments. So what exactly are new towns? New towns and planned cities are urban areas where deep consideration has gone into the spatial organization of infrastructure, uses, and networks. When we talk about new towns, we're referring to urban developments constructed on previously unbuilt or greenfield sites, or what is officially considered greenfield. New towns are also constructed from planning documents developed at a specific moment in time, so they always reflect the assumptions, values, and ideas of their times. Because of this planning process, they reflect a single vision for the future, a future that may or may not come to pass. New towns also exhibit some degree of political autonomy, whether they are led by a mayor, city manager, or other civic leadership. New towns are also mixed use developments, which means they have different kinds of urban programming, like commercial, business, education, or even recreational areas. In many cases, they try to be environments where residents can work, live, and play. This also helps distinguish them from large residential developments, which only offer housing. Additionally, new towns have at least 10,000 residents. They can, however, have millions of residents, like Abuja, Nigeria, or the new administrative capital of Egypt, Wedian City. Comprehensively planned cities are, of course, not new to Africa, though evidence of these cities was largely destroyed by colonial occupiers during the 19th century. To simplify things when we think about urban planning history, we can look at four distinct eras of new town construction in Africa. The ancient era from 2000 BC to 1884 when the Berlin Conference regulated the European scramble for Africa. The colonial period from roughly 1884 to 1960 or the year of Africa when 17 countries declared independence. The independence era from 1960 to 1990 and what we can call the neoliberal era from 1990 to present day. It's an exciting time to study African cities because researchers are just now rediscovering some ancient new towns through new archeological insights that indicate geometric order, clear spatial patterns, and monumentality in urban remnants. Until recently, many people thought that comprehensive urban planning in Africa began with colonizers. But now we see more and more evidence that this was a lie perpetuated by colonial occupiers who wanted to exploit local resources and frame a different narrative of African societies for other Europeans. Some of these new insights have led to better understandings about new towns like Edo, Nigeria, now called Benin City. Edo was designed based on perfect fractals and included underground drainage and a sophisticated centralized bureaucracy. When writing home about his impressions of the city in 1691, the Portuguese ship captain Lorenzo Pinto observed, Great Benin, where the king resides, is larger than Lisbon. All the streets run straight and as far as the eye can see. 
the city is wealthy and industrious. It is so well governed that theft is unknown and the people live in such security that they have no doors on their houses. In contrast, London at the same time is described by historian Bruce Holsinger as being a city of thievery, prostitution, murder, bribery, and a thriving black market. Although colonizers were present and building in different locations before 1884, this was the year of the infamous Berlin Conference, or the moment when European powers gathered together to regulate their scramble for Africa. By 1911, 90% of the African continent was under European control. Colonial new towns of this era were designed based on popular planning ideas in European countries like the Garden City model. Administrators, planners, architects, and others imported these ideas to African countries and applied them to local contexts. During this time, many colonial occupiers used urban planning to give form to their political power and social practices. New towns were sometimes part of this strategy to control local populations and resources. One example of this is the new town of Lusaka, the capital of Zambia. In 1935, the site for Lusaka was chosen for its proximity to railway lines and roads. It was designed by English architect and planner Stanley Adseed with lots of trees and flowers, open space, green lawns, wide streets, and described by him as a generous, gracious city. Like every single new town of this era, however, Lusaka was designed to strictly separate local people from the colonizers and reinforce a perceived social hierarchy. Housing, recreational areas, public health institutions, and schools were all spatially segregated based on race, and you can still see many of these divisions today. Following the horrors of the colonial era, a wave of independence swept across Africa in the middle of the 20th century. 1960 is commonly referred to as the Year of Africa because 17 African nations declared independence in that year. Newly elected heads of state made it a priority to bring together diverse tribal allegiances in a national identity. In some cases, that translated to new towns that were also new capital cities often at the geographical center of the newly independent nations. These new towns were often influenced by ideas of African socialism and democracy, and designed to support industry and development. After 1990, we can see an almost continent-wide shift towards more neoliberal economic policies. And this shift leads to an increase in privately developed new towns, eco-cities, and resort cities in Africa. International developers, international private financing, and international designers began initiating new towns in larger numbers than ever before. It's also clear that new towns have become increasingly popular with Africa's middle class at home and in the diaspora. The aspirational lifestyles marketed by developers uses seductive rhetoric that frame these developments as desirable and safe alternatives to existing cities. If we look at target groups for these new towns, we also see something interesting, a shift from mixed income development in the early independence era to higher end development since the 1990s. This demographic change is also reflected in the cities themselves. While independence era new towns often included industrial areas, ports, and universities, contemporary new towns are more likely to include business districts and leisure facilities. This means that lower income residents are effectively priced out of contemporary new towns. In the current generation of new towns, we see that these developments largely function as enclaves, advertising their housing with terminology that references safety, lifestyle, and less explicitly, homogeny or people like you. You might say, why is this a problem? Privately developed new towns meet a market demand. They supply housing for people who can afford it. So, what is the problem with new towns? In Africa, people live in many different ways across many geographic regions. But UN Habitat estimates that 56% of urban dwellers in sub-Saharan Africa lived in slums in 2014, the highest rates in the world. That number looks very different in North Africa, where only 12% of urban residents lived in slums in 2014. But that means the majority of urban housing in sub-Saharan Africa is built without permits and often without meeting planning and safety regulations. 
That number has many causes, but one of the main causes is that most people cannot afford to build or buy within the formal frameworks. So when new towns frame themselves as cities without slums, or a kind of exclusive alternative for higher income groups, they are basically saying that low-income residents do not belong in these cities. On the ground, that can result in the kind of urbanization patterns we see around Luanda and Gola. For example, Hilamba is a new town at Luanda's periphery, and informal communities are growing adjacent to the new town's borders. These communities often settle on what has been called low-cost, high-risk land, meaning they may be built cheaply, but are built in areas at risk of flooding, landslides, or other natural disasters. When urban patterns like this appear, inequalities become increasingly visible. While residents of the adjacent settlements may have economic and social interdependencies, the residents of the unplanned community will not have access to the public services available in the new towns. Another aspect of this problem is that many African countries currently face huge housing deficits. The rate of housing construction cannot keep pace with natural repopulation and the influx of new residents from rural areas. When governments and the private sector cannot keep up, the problem compounds every year. In general, the urban poor are the ones who suffer when housing is unavailable. New towns in their current form do not adequately address these housing shortages. When housing actually is constructed for low-income groups, it may remain financially inaccessible or become sub-rented to middle-class groups, meaning that the urban poor continue to live in areas without access to so-called public services like clean water, sewage, electricity, and paved roads. Our ultimate goal with this project is to suggest an alternative way forward for new towns in Africa. To do that, we first have to understand the spatial challenges that current new towns face. Based on quantitative analysis of 146 African new towns since 1960, and empirical analysis of three case studies, a number of recurring spatial challenges can be identified. Not every challenge applies to every example, but they are all issues that arise repeatedly in the dataset. Many new towns are designed for car-based transit and fail to incorporate public transport options sufficiently. This has a stronger impact on low-income communities who may not be able to afford car ownership. When cheaper alternatives like minibuses and tuk-tuks are regulated against, low-income groups are forced to pay more, walk longer distances, or invent new solutions. Many new towns, like Kilamba Angola, for example, have large public spaces, but without clear programming. This has the effect of creating public spaces that are underused and unattractive. Some, like Sheikh Said city in Egypt, may offer semi-private alternatives like open air malls or plazas that are controlled by gates and guards. Public spaces are critical to supporting inclusivity. As Rashik Fatar, director of Our Future Cities has written, Public spaces build cohesion, develop feelings of belonging and inclusivity, and give tangible expression to a more democratic, equitable society. Both of these examples also lack housing stock diversity. Sheikh Said housing stock is sharply differentiated between low-rise social housing blocks and luxury apartments and villas within gated compounds. And Kilamba only offers three different types of apartments. These same examples also reveal spatial segregation at two different scales. Sheikh Zaid city shows a clear division within the new town between gated compounds and social housing blocks, while Kilamba's official borders divide the new town from its adjacent informal community. The insufficient employment opportunities within both new towns is informed by a lack of commercial facilities and leads to extensive commuting between the new towns and the closest large cities. Cairo, and Luanda. No existing communities were reportedly displaced by the development of Kilamba or Sheikh Zayed, although both Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International have publicized forced evictions in connection with other new towns. Research from the World Bank has shown that when the only housing available is too expensive, it can actually increase the growth of unplanned development. New towns are often envisioned as complete projects rather than a long process without culmination. 
This design approach imagines a specific future based on demographic projections and relies on quantifiable data sets rather than the evolving experiences of residents. Taking a final product approach to these new towns limits their ability to adapt to changing conditions over time. Green spaces and natural areas also need to be protected. Most new towns do not invest in public parks, recreational networks, or natural areas. These spaces must be well designed and maintained to protect the ecology of the site and provide health benefits to residents. At a larger scale, new towns must not encroach on land that is needed for wildlife corridors or agricultural production. Food security must be considered when selecting a site for the new town. These spatial challenges recur repeatedly in the new towns included in this research. While each example will face an individual set of challenges, identifying the spatial challenges that appear repeatedly among contemporary new towns can help illuminate a general approach that can, in turn, be tailored to individual sites. In this film, we talked about new towns as an urban typology, new towns across Africa from a historical perspective, and the spatial challenges we see in the current generation. Based on this understanding, we can look for new ways to develop new towns that address the challenges we identified here. In the next film, we'll do just that, and explore an alternative planning approach that prioritizes adaptive growth for new towns in Africa. This approach was developed in collaboration with the International New Town Institute. More information on this alternative new town planning can be found in our recent book, To Build a City in Africa, A History and a Manual. Until next time.